Isn't it fascinating how physics surprises us? For most of my conscious life, I thought I knew why geysers erupt. And if you search on YouTube for something like how do geysers work, you'll likely hear the same explanation. But recently, scientists revisited the mechanism behind geysers, and came to the conclusion, that, in most cases, they erupt for quite different reasons, and these eruptions happen in a significantly different manner. Subscribe to the channel, and let's dive into understanding how these amazing phenomena really work. The phenomenology of a geyser eruption looks like this. First, the geyser is at rest, just appearing as a hole in the ground. After a while, water mixed with occasional bubbles of steam starts trickling out of this hole, known as the source phase. Then, the flow suddenly accelerates, transitioning into the actual eruption, where significant masses of water, mixed with steam, are forcefully ejected from the channel at a tremendous speed. Following the eruption is the steam phase, where only hot steam emerges from the geyser's channel. After some time, the steam flow subsides, and the cycle repeats. The classical explanation of how geysers work was provided by Robert Bunsen in 1847, the inventor of the famous Bunsen burner, and an all-around impressive individual. According to Bunsen, a geyser is relatively simple in structure, resembling a narrow vertical channel connected at its lower part to heated tectonic rocks. In the resting phase, the channel is filled with relatively cold water, which could be groundwater, water from surface water bodies, melting snow, or simply water left from a previous eruption, essentially anything. As the channel fills up, the water gradually heats up. In the lower part of the channel, where the temperature is highest, the water's temperature quickly exceeds the boiling point of 100 degrees. However, the pressure of the water column in the channel raises the boiling point, preventing the lower layers of water from boiling, while the upper layers have yet to heat up. Due to the narrowness of the channel, which suppresses convection, the main heat transfer mechanism in liquids, heat exchange occurs relatively slowly. Nonetheless, the heat emanating from the Earth's depths gradually warms up the upper layers of the water column. Eventually, at a certain depth, boiling begins. The forming water bubbles gradually displace water from the channel, initiating the source phase. This is where it gets interesting. As the water flows out of the channel, the pressure on the underlying overheated layers decreases, causing their boiling point to drop as well. Boiling engulfs new layers, leading to a more intense expulsion of water from the channel, further lowering the pressure, expanding the boiling zone, and so on, triggering a chain reaction, which, like any respectable chain reaction, becomes explosive. This is how geyser eruptions were explained by Bunsen, and this explanation can be found online. I myself believed in this explanation for a long time. However, even before Bunsen, there was another model, the so-called steam trap model proposed in 1811 by the geologist Mackenzie. In this model, a geyser has a more complex structure, horizontal cavities, the very traps that gave the model its name, are attached to the vertical channel. Just like in Bunsen's model, it all begins with the filling of the geyser, both the channel and the traps, with water. The horizontal cavities are, of course, not completely filled, beneath their ceiling, a small air cushion remains, compressed enough to balance the gas pressure with the water column pressure. Water vaporization, heated by the hot walls of the cavities acting as boilers, takes place inside this cushion. As the steam-air mixture saturates and heats up in the boiler, it exerts increasing pressure on the water, gradually displacing it from the boiler, and from the geyser altogether. The source phase begins. The most intriguing part starts when steam completely displaces water from the boiler and gradually starts pushing it out of the channel. Let's observe how the pressures of the water and steam columns inside the boiler change during this process. We'll analyze this in the so-called adiabatic approximation, assuming that the processes unfold rapidly enough for us to neglect heat exchange between the gas, water, and chamber walls. So, let's say the volume of steam inside the boiler increased by some amount, delta V. Obviously, this will be accompanied by the displacement of an equivalent volume of water from the channel, causing a decrease in the height of the water column in the channel by a height delta H, equal to delta V divided by S, the cross-sectional area of the channel. Consequently, the pressure of this water column will decrease by a value rho times g times delta h, where rho is the density of water and g is the acceleration due to gravity. We'll remember this value for later use. Now, let's understand how the pressure of the steam in the boiler changed during this same process. Since the steam began to occupy a larger volume, it expanded, thus reducing its pressure. But the question is, by how much? The pressure of the steam will decrease by an amount equal to dp slash dv, which is the derivative of pressure with respect to volume, multiplied by delta V. The derivative can be found from the standard equation of state for an adiabatic process, 
the product of pressure and volume to the power of gamma equals a constant, denoted as C. Here, gamma is the adiabatic index, which for water is 1.4. So, the derivative dp slash dv can be expressed as C multiplied by gamma divided by V to the power of gamma plus 1. Plugging this into our formula, we get the following expression. It's not difficult to determine the constant C, if we remember that at the initial moment, the pressure in the boiler was equal to the pressure of the water column. Substituting this expression into the equation of state, we obtain that the constant C is equal to the product of rho, the density of water, and V, the volume of the boiler, to the power of gamma. If you've started to fear these formulas, don't worry, we're almost done. The change in steam pressure in the boiler when increasing its volume by delta V will be finally written in this way. It's easy to notice a very simple thing. If the volume of the boiler is large enough, the reduction in pressure when increasing the volume of the steam will be insignificant. At the same time, the drop in water column pressure in a sufficiently narrow channel with the same change in water volume can be significant. In simpler terms, when steam displaces a small portion of water from the channel, the pressure of the water column decreases more than the pressure of the steam decreases due to its expansion. That is, the pressure difference at the water and steam boundary as water is pushed out of the channel will keep increasing and the speed of its discharge will keep rising eventually leading to the transition from the source phase to the eruption phase. When all the water from the channel is pushed out, the hot steam will freely escape from the boiler. The steaming phase begins, which will last until the steam pressure equals atmospheric pressure. After that, the eruption will end, and the geyser will return to the resting phase until it fills up with water again. This is, however, a necessary but not sufficient condition. We mentioned earlier that all calculations are made in the adiabatic approximation, which is not always valid. For example, the system won't work while the water in the channel is cold enough, due to the contact of hot steam with cold water, its temperature will decrease, and the pressure will drop. So, to initiate an eruption, the water in the channel must first heat up to a certain temperature. However, this temperature doesn't necessarily have to be as high as in the case of the Bunsen model we discussed earlier. As we mentioned, both models were known to scientists since the 19th century. However, specialists still preferred Bunsen's model partly because they considered Mackenzie's proposed structures to be quite complex and unlikely to form too often. Moreover, they thought these structures couldn't lead to the formation of entire geyser fields like the ones we observe in the Valley of Geysers in Kamchatka, or in Yellowstone National Park in the USA. However, in 2014, when scientists working in the Valley of Geysers conducted a study of the internal structure of geysers using special thermally stable video cameras, they found that all of them contain the boiler chambers predicted by Mackenzie. Later, the same results were obtained from studies of geysers in Yellowstone. Perhaps the decisive argument in favor of the steam trap theory was an experiment conducted by nature itself in the Valley of Geysers. A landslide blocked the Gizernaya River, creating something like a lake up to 20 meters deep, covering the mouths of the big and small geysers, whose eruption stopped as a result. Based on the steam trap model, it's easy to understand why this happened. Indeed, if the geysers channel leads into the lake, the rules of the game change, Pushing a certain portion of water out of the channel no longer leads to a great reduction in the water column's pressure. After all, this pressure now consists not only of the channel water column pressure, but also the pressure of the water in the lake, which cannot significantly change due to the displacement of a small amount of water from the channel. So, eruptions became impossible. Instead, the geysers simply slowly poured water into the lake, which, as measurements showed, was heated to a temperature of about 26 degrees. Water gradually eroded the natural dam formed as a result of the landslide, and the water level in the lake decreased until finally, after three months, the outlet of the big geyser channels emerged above the water surface. And as soon as this happened, the geyser started erupting again, with each eruption cycle lasting only 30 to 40 minutes. This became the ultimate confirmation of the chamber mechanism because it's evident that no underground heat could boil several tons of water, which the geyser ejected, in such a short time during each eruption. Thus, it seems that the chamber mechanism is indeed the basis for the operation of most geysers in Kamchatka and Yellowstone Park. However, theoretically, the existence of geysers operating on the Bunsen mechanism is not excluded. After all, similar structures can also form, and the mechanism described by Bunsen should also lead to their eruptions. By the way, the chamber operating principle is used in the so-called geyser coffee makers, which, as you know, are divided into three parts. The lower chamber, where water is poured, is essentially the boiler in which water turns into steam when heated. This steam displaces water from the boiler, passing it through a vertical tube to the central chamber, where the ground coffee is located. From there, 
the brewed coffee goes through the second tube to the upper chamber, from where it is poured into cups. Moreover, the pressure of the water column in this upper tube provides the conditions for the coffee to brew, meaning the substances contained in the ground beans dissolve in hot water. Of course, this coffee maker doesn't need to erupt, the process should go smoothly, so the volumes of the chambers and the heights of the tubes must be in a certain ratio. That's why such coffee makers always have approximately the same proportions. In general, physics is wonderful and amazing, from mighty geysers to miniature and convenient coffee makers. And the most amazing thing about it is that this science is capable of surprising us even in the most unexpected questions, and that's why we'll have plenty of topics to discuss on this channel, including over a cup of delicious coffee.